Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Radisic. I'm the Managing Director of the Clada Software Association. And today we have with us Sunir Shah from AppBind. He's going to take us through how he maps out partners to get to market faster. Um, we have uh, many slides. Uh, he's going to get through everything from scanning media for commentary, uh, how to organize your market for mapping, identify competitors, positioning statements, the list goes on. So um, without further ado, I won't take up any of that time. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sneer and uh, he's going to take it from here. All right, enjoy. Thank you, Evan. Uh, some of you may know me because I also run the Cloud Software Association and founded it, but for those who are joining to the video, um, so we are all the SaaS partnership people. And one of the interesting things that I've had done along my career uh, is, uh, you know, I started the partnership team at FreshBooks when Casey was working there too. And uh, then at Olark, also Casey was there too. Actually, Casey, just follow along everywhere. It's great. It's, uh, it's true. I did this. I've, and I was consulting for a while as well. I did this. I basically, this is my table stakes beginning of every project for partnerships is understanding like who is the market and who are we partnering with is really the core question. But there's really more to it than that. And I've done it like for Format and Scrumble and B and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, you know, so I, there's a lot of tactical stuff to get into, but I just want there, there's a lot. So my goal is not to overwhelm you, but to give you a, like an idea of how to even think about this stuff. And also, but, but there's a bunch of tactical stuff in here. Uh, but I do want to just give you a quick high level uh, in, to get yourself in, in the frame of thought. But before I do that, because I'm going to basically like blow your minds by the end of this, and I'd like to do my little PSA for what I'm doing. I'm not just, you know, you know, your go to you know, plucky leader of the Cloud Software Association. I do have my own company now. We spent last year working on the service partner side, what we're doing, but you know, AppBind this year is really working on SaaS companies. Uh, and our problem that we're trying to solve is why is it so hard to sell subscription software through partners? This is really difficult. After all, customers own their own data, how do partners create accounts, and getting between the customers recurring billing is a total nightmare for them in accounting, uh, as well as financial risk. And this is why we almost always do a workaround like referrals, uh, but we actually support you to actually support your service companies to build businesses around you. And so we make it really easy, you know, instead of using their own email address and their own credit cards, your service partners can use AppLine's virtual email and credit card to sign up and manage licenses. We automatically forward all the emails to their customers and all the charges to automatically expense. And for you, we have a turnkey, no engineering, get it going as of like today, if you want to reseller portal, you can just turn on. Uh, so you don't have to go to engineering and you start actually activating your service partners. And this is what I do most of the time when I'm not putting together ginormous slide decks. So you will, hopefully you will talk to me when you actually have this problem. Uh, thank you very much. So with that, my high level, why are we even doing partnerships? We should all know this, but I don't think we do. Uh, and this is my standard shtick. If you ever heard me talk about this, this is my absolute favorite book, uh, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. And I, it is central, but he has a really good definition for what a market is that is critical for partnership people to understand because this is what we do. So in his view, paraphrasing, a market is a defined group of people who refer to each other for purchasing decisions. And this is a very deep idea, but I wanna to get to the point about the referring part. So what he means is not just word of mouth. He means like anywhere a customer may go to learn about their job, their data. data. Uh, and this could not be just like, I have a problem looking for solutions. People are also learning, what is my problem? They don't even know. Uh, but it could be, you know, it's obviously gonna be like media, like blogs and radio and TV, magazines, conferences, whatever, but it also means like service partners, other software products they're using, hardware, anything, anything in the market around them. You know, your customers, uh, and this is the key, your customers don't care about you fundamentally because they don't even know who you are. They have their own day, they're going about their day and they have this ecosystem of stuff around them that they've constructed in order to allow them to get through that day and do their job, right? And your job as a partnership manager is to understand their universe, their ecosystem. And this is why mapping the market is so important as a partnership person because this is how your customers are going to get information about your offering. And so, you know, whenever you're talking about go to market, it always has to start with the customer because you're the market, right? And this is why you have to map it. And while there are a lot of channels that your customer uses like media or search engine or clubhouse or podcast or whatever they're do doing that your direct marketing team or maybe even direct sales can access using normal digital marketing or other forms of marketing, right? The partnership team comes into play 
when there's a company between you and the customer where you need to build a relationship for them to tell your story to the customer to make that sale. You're fundamentally a relationship marketer. Whenever the relationship marketing skills come to play, the partnership team comes in and handles it. That is what you do. So when you're doing that, you have to remember that we're playing a game of broken telephone. You know, your partners also don't care about you, no offense. Uh, they have to care about themselves. They're selling themselves to their customers. They're closer to the customer. They have their own story. They're telling the customer make the sale. You have to be a great storyteller about your own story and have your story fit into their story, making your partner's story better so that they can sell better to, to get to the customer. And this is why partnership people have to be really good at positioning. And I will say that the partnership teams almost always have the best sense of positioning at the company because your role is to figure out how you fit in to the market and how you get other people to tell your story, right? And you know, a lot of people in the direct marketing and sales or your CEO may feel like they get it, but they're kind of, they don't need to because they're, ne they're, they're, they're interacting with customers directly. There's a lot you can do to overcome a bad story. But when you're selling through someone else who has to tell your story, you know very quickly that your story is not playing because they have to like, it's broken telephone. They have to relay your story. You have to get it sharp. So you have to get really, really good at it. And here are two really good books, uh, the classic positioning, uh, Reason Jack Trout and uh, April Dunford's book, uh, which is new. Uh, and I have to, I'm still getting through it, but this is more tactical about how to actually do positioning. So I won't get into what she suggests. I suggest reading that book. I'll give you some like really simple ideas about what to do. Okay, that's enough high level nonsense. Let's get to it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And this is this comes straight out of my consulting how to doc whenever I onboard a new client. These are like literally the steps I would follow following through, you know, like a to do step by step. Number one, no partnership team exists unless there's already like a marketing function that works. Like you're always later. So you probably already in the company know a lot of what's going on in the market. So step one is just to ask everybody. It's not crazy. You probably have an ideal customer profile. That's actually a lie. There's never been a client I've had that actually has an ICP set up correctly. That's almost always the first thing I deliver. But if you have one, get it. Uh, or they have made, made something up that's, that's incomplete, but that's at least the table stakes where everyone is at. Obviously ask your product team and your product marketing team what category they're in. Ask your sales team what the pitches are, the objections. Ask your support team what's the most common tickets, especially when it relates to other companies, the products, what are the top feature requests. Ask your marketing team what channels they're in, you know, whether they're all LinkedIn, what conferences uh, they're going to, what blogs they're, they're, they're tracking, what associations, whatever. Right? This is your story. They, they probably already have some kind, some kind of map. You might already have current partnerships in place. They often inbound through the CEO ad hoc random nonsense, uh, at least uh, enumerate them. Uh, they may not be very good partnerships, but at least gives you an idea of what kind of partnerships are out there that you have to contend with. Either way, you're gonna have to deal with it eventually. Check the product roadmap. There's gonna be likely integrations that are coming from customer demand. Salesforce, for instance, is almost always a thing in B2B SaaS, uh, but there could be other things that come up. Um, there might be past successes and failures as well uh, from partnerships, just even if they failed because they didn't know what to do, uh, we were just had a talk with uh, Smile Software. We were talking about how they're having a hard time with resellers because they didn't know what to do with them. Uh, just because you didn't know what to do with them and they failed doesn't mean you can't do it again, but at least gives you an idea of what happened and where there's demand. And of course, everyone knows their competitors, you know, so we'll you know, enumerate them. You'll see that's going to be a critical part of mapping uh, your market because your competitors are quite searchable. And everything that they're doing can teach you a lot. But Frankly, I trust nobody uh, because um, like I said, there's a kind of a bias when you're doing direct sales and direct marketing to not really get the customer mindset uh, really strong. You know, I've asked many CEOs when I was consulting to them, what's your core priority? And they said more MRR. I'm like, that is not a, that is not a corporate goal. <laughs> more revenue is not a corporate goal. I'll tell you why. Because what are, you know, when you're driving, whatever you focus on is where you're gonna head with the car. And whatever you're focusing on as a business is your customer. Your bank account already has all your money and it can't give you any more money, right? So it can't be a strategic goal for the company to have more revenue in your bank account. The only thing you could do is change what you're doing in the market outside, right? And I find a lot of the times the partnership person comes in and the company has not has spent so much time reacting to inbound demand at a certain point to get to the, where they are. They have lost 
a perception of what's going on from the customer's point of view. And if you start with the attitude that your customer doesn't care about you and your partner doesn't care about you, even the ones who love you, they still, they just can't because they have their own priorities in life that are not you, right? And your job is to empathize with that and get inside their head and figure out how you support their goals, right? Then you're going to be a winning partnership person because that's what the partnership team is all about is relationship marketing. Okay, so one of the things that I will point out uh, that I got to this place is I do have a master's degree in, in like user research. So these questions I've honed over some period of time and I have a process to, to crunch it. That doesn't matter. This is the simplest possible way of answering these questions and anything you can do get the data and like report on it, even if you just look at it and just write up a paragraph summarizing it is gonna be good. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to go like super intense. Uh, you can, I'll show you some intense things you can do, but uh, really anything is good. Um, step one is just who is your customer, you know, and, and what segment you're in. Because often your partners that you're going to want to talk to, you want to know if you have overlapping customers and whether you're serving the same segment, same industry, same company size, whatever. There's a million firmographic questions you could ask. These are just a few of them. You can Google them, you know, what industry, you know, what jurisdiction, there's lots of things you can ask, but you should know roughly who your ideal customer is along the major dimensions because you need to tell the partners you're working with that you're serving the same customers or of the customers they're serving. These are the overlapping segments that we have. You need to know this. A lot of companies actually don't know this. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I'll show you a way late in a couple slides about how to do this using your existing customer database, uh, but you should ask your customers as well because there's a fundamental idea in that Crossing the Chasm book and also in ethnic, uh, ethnographic research is you cannot describe for someone else their identity. People can only self-describe their identity. You can't ascribe an identity to somebody. You need to have people describe in their own words what they think they're doing, right? Because that's when they're on the internet, that's how they're building communities and po points of view is from always from their own mindset, right? So you need to get the words out of the customer. Right. Okay. This is the absolute most important set of questions. And this is the only, this purple question is the only purple question because it's absolutely the most important question you can ask is how would you describe your product or service to a friend or colleague in your own words, right? And the reason why this matters is your customers, because they don't care about you, they can only understand you using the least amount of energy in their own minds because we're like, we're, we have meat brains, you know? so. They, they reconstruct whatever you're telling them using concepts they already have in their own mind and they do it with the least amount of effort. And so you, what you wanna do is align your message to a story that they intrinsically understand and relate to other ideas. This is what positioning is. So they can tell your story to someone else. So this is how word of mouth happens. You basically don't tell them what to say you get them to tell you what they're already saying, and then you build that and you just align to whatever they want you to be in the words that they're using. And that's what you use in messaging, right? And this is critical. Um, this is a very critical question. Uh, pretty much uh, this, is the main, this is the main line for getting your positioning statement. And it's so easy actually, once you do it, you'll just people will tell you literally what you are. And it's like, well, that's it. That's what we are. It's simple. It's like so much simpler than any of the complex you know, market research positioning nonsense you can do. Just ask the customers how they would describe you. Um, the next three questions are just like how you fit into their world. You know, what problem you're solving? How do you measure success? If you don't use this anymore, what, what would you do? Uh, this gives you an idea of in their mind, what is the problem that you're solving, right? And you've ever heard of the concept of jobs to be done? This is really important because it starts understanding the use case the workflow that you're in, because then you can start evaluating, asking them more about that workflow. And you start, when you're thinking about partnerships, right? Then you can say, well, oh, you start like, well, how do you, how do you solve, like we're a billing tool, like what do you use for accounting? We start identifying the accounting systems. What do you use for time tracking? You know, what are you using for uh, password management? These are things that are interesting in AppPine because this is part of the overall solution. And then we start identifying partners around them because you can start inquiring about these things more in depth, right? And get the customer to tell you a story about their day-to-day -day from their point of view, whether you're involved or not, right? And this is a very, very, very good way to get the actual core partners out of your customer's mind is just inquiring after these. So this is absolutely the most important set of questions. Absolutely. Um, basic other things, product enhancements, you know, most favorite, least favorite, what can we do better questions, also useful. 
uh, for product in general. Also, you'll get the integrations out of this as well. Uh, MPS, we all know about. You should ask this in general while you're doing the survey. Um, you can also just directly ask people what partners to work with. It's like, hey, who do you work with? Just straight up ask them. You know, they will tell you. You'll be surprised. The, the first question is like really the like the most lucrative I've ever found. You know, just what software do you use? People will tell you amazingly detailed answers, right? Uh, also, if you have an integrations page, you should always you should have a little form, a one a one uh, one line form. You know, just open text form. What else should we integrate with? What should we integrate with next? What are we missing? Simple. Maybe two lines if you want to capture the email address to follow up with them when you do it. Just put that up there. People will tell you all the time like, what you should be doing. It's incredible. Uh, you should also ask them, you know, if they have service companies they're working with or agencies as well, you know, because uh, then you can start to meet them. And in fact, I would actually argue on the sign up survey uh, when you're doing sign up, you should just ask them straight up as well. This doesn't impact conversions at all. Uh, how did you hear about us? Don't do a drop down because that's silly. Do uh, uh, like an open field one liner. It's harder to read, but you'll get actually more accurate information. I mean, a lot of we just Google, right? But then you'll see, oh, this podcast or this association or whatever. You'll see like specific people you should be targeting. Uh, that is, you know, 50% of people usually fill out, how did you hear about us? And it is, it is absolutely the most interesting uh, data from a market research point of view. And I really think anyone who has a company where you think service partners are there should be asking, are you signing up for yourself or on behalf of a client? You, most of us have a shadow channel where the signups are actually not being done by the end customer. They're being done by some service company. And even if it's done by the customer, you can ask the question the other way. Have you hired a company to manage the software for you? Or have you been, or were you recommended by a company you've hired to set up the software? Some variant on that question to see if they're coming in via uh, shadow referral. Uh, then you can start to say, oh, great. We can send you the, send your partner. Uh, we'll send your partner a setup kit. So put their email address and we'll send them uh, a, you know, a kit to set this thing up. But then you've got them, right? Then you can get them into the partner program. Uh, and you'll find like, this is, um, you know, you'll find you have a way bigger channel than you even thought about because most partners don't even want to talk to you. Uh, but here it's part of the sign up flow, right? Um, and then, you know, you can again just straight up ask them from a market research point of view, like, what should I read? And, you know, where can I go? And, uh, you know, not everyone answers this question, but you'd be surprised. They'll give you like really good blogs and online communities. Uh, you might as well just ask them while you're doing a perception survey uh, at the end. So, like, I'll give you the slides later, but these questions, you can just like fire off right away to your customer base and you'll be surprised how useful that is, you know. Um, so the firmographic stuff is kind of really hard to get out of customers. That's kind of a waste of time uh, up front. So you want to kind of limit it as just kind of a warm up set of questions. There are really good tools that do enrichment. So many of you are using built with, I hope. This thing is just amazing. Mm -hmm. These New Zealanders, man, uh, they are Gary. It's actually Gary, one guy. <laughs> he's like, he's unbelievable. This thing has so much data in it. It tracks like everything. So what this thing does, uh, if you don't know what Built With does, is it looks at the site and other kinds of like available data from the internet, like the mail servers and all this stuff they can, they can scrape to figure out what software is being used to run that website. And then they've built it into lead lists. They, do, like they, they see when, when products have been added or removed. Um, it is extremely detailed data. Uh, and they've added things like keyword lists now, which is new, which so if you're looking for, I'll show you in a second, uh, you start hearing like uh, some key phrases coming up. You can put that in this thing. It will sh show you all the websites that scrape with those key phrases on it as well and they'll keep you up to date. It's just an amazingly powerful tool. And it's like $500 a month, but I think it pays for itself pretty quickly if you have a good sales process. So I would just stick with this. Uh, another really good tool is Clearbit. I use this all the time. I use this batch enhancement because how often do you need to do it? Or you can buy a subscription uh, to them. Um, but what you can get from Clearbit is they will, they have like, I don't know, 60 columns of data uh, from a from a from a graphics point of view, uh, it will just give you the stuff that I, you can ask the customer, and then you can just slice and dice the data based on it. So, like the role uh, and the level of the customer, they'll tell you 
they'll tell you what category they're in. There's actually four different in, like industry category columns. They'll tell you uh, what technology they're using like built with as well. It is extremely useful uh, piece of information. So like, for instance, you see here Magento is one of the things that comes up. So you might say, oh, I need to get onto like a Magento partnership, right? For instance, a lot of my customers are on that shopping cart platform immediately simplifies a lot of things. And this is like, you know, it takes them like, you, up, you get a customer list, you upload it to them in 20 minutes, they'll crunch it, you get it back, you know, and then you just slice and dice this using, you know, Excel pivot table. And then, you know, by the end of the afternoon, you already have a list of like 40 partners to go after, right? It's like easy, it's amazing. All right, so that is like how you get the baseline data from your customers. Now I'm gonna get into like, what do you do with it? Because it's gonna be a, like a ball of data. And I, I, there's a lot you can do on, on Excel spreadsheets. I don't wanna get into that because that's just overwhelmingly nerdy, but I'll show you some key tips. So number one, uh, I have a spreadsheet that I just keep updating over and over again, where I keep every set type of relationship that I'm acquiring. So this is at my actual one for AppBind. So here's a list of subreddits I'm tracking. For instance, online communities are actually extremely useful because you start listening to what people are saying uh, all the time. So I track them, I subscribe to them on Reddit. I spend a lot of time on Reddit actually, uh, more than in the CSA Slack, I suppose, uh, reading this stuff uh, to learn about the customers. Uh, you can see I have LinkedIn groups, blogs, media lists, anything I'm finding, I'm building a database and keeping it here over time. Otherwise, you know, you'll lose your mind. You know, You can't use it using bookmarks because eventually you're going to run campaigns against sets of, you know, I'm going to run Reddit, Reddit ads against this group. I'm going to run LinkedIn ads, or I might want to spend some time building my, my cache in the LinkedIn groups, spend a month doing that. Uh, so I try to organize it here so I can organize my campaigns against it. I also build a journal of key phrases. Uh, and this is really important. So this is for, you know, AppBind. So, you know, all the words that come up when I'm like talking to the, the ideal target, uh, you know, words that come up on, you know, whether or not we're serving it or not, these are the things that keep coming up uh, as keywords in their conversation, the jargon that they're using. This is useful, like I said, with built with or other tools, you can search around for these, these terms now and start identifying people talking about it, looking for media, looking for related products, looking for customers. This is what this is what's on their mind. And also, when you're doing this kind of positioning word of mouth, level of communication, this is the words that people are using. So you kind of want to align with the jargon in the industry, whether you know, you know, we aren't a referral program, we're a reselling program, right? But even software resellers are a different thing. So we have to position ourselves against these terms. It doesn't matter, that's where the conversation is at, right? So I'm keeping a journal as I'm going, uh, as I'm reading about everything. And this is important. It's not just about building lists of targets, about, it's, it's really about getting inside the mind of the targets and keeping a record of like what you're learning as you go. Um, I am a big fan on the surveys of using open fields uh, to get the customers to use their own words uh, to describe themselves like job roles in particular. You'd be surprised how varied those titles can be. And it actually tells you more about what's going on in their mind. Uh, it is an absolute pain to report on because uh, you wanna centralize those kind of things or are they support or sales or developers? And I hand tag them. Uh, I actually wrote a Python script that allows me to uh, dynamically and progressively improve my tagging over time. Uh, you are unlikely to do that. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to guess. So uh, what I would suggest is do like, get like 100 or so open, like, open fields, uh, and then you get a sense of what's going on. And then you can just switch the survey to uh, pick list or just use this pick list because it's for roles, but for other things, you know, how did you hear about us? I like the open field, but maybe eventually just go blog, media, Facebook, whatever, um, I know, whatever you want to do. So you can, you can certainly, um, you know, optimize the open field to a pick list to make it easy to report on in the future. But this is good at the beginning because you're learning about what's going on in the customer's mind from using their own words. And then finally, when you're reporting this stuff out, uh, I found that no one can compare the, like a number 50 to 10. 50 is bigger than 10. You'd be surprised how many people can't understand that concept when you're going through a lot of ideas at once. So it's good to visualize things using, I just find histograms really easy, which is you take a pivot table right, of the data, it counts it 
and then you graph it with a bar chart. It's really simple to do. And you don't really have to be more complicated than that. Pivot table plus bar chart equals win for, for reporting. Uh, don't go crazy, you know. And don't use pie charts, they're absolutely useless. Use this. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath here because now we're gonna get into the, what do you do with all this data to keep going? Is there any questions about how to like get that initial picture of the customers? All right, I can even see if there's questions in the chat. What's going on? Hey, we're gonna provide these slides afterwards. So don't try to kind of get everything in. Um, you'll have a recording and the slides to kind of go off of as well, so. All right. Thank this you, like... I can rest my hand now. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> This is so tactical. Uh, Evan said, like, get ta more tactical, get more tactical. You're so high level, Sunir. It's like, all right, I'll show well, you. I'll show you like we're doing three sessions in one essentially, but um, I figure we just get all the stuff in here and then, um, yeah, you guys can take a look and, and go from there. We could always uh, dive deeper into one aspect of, of Yeah, this thing. I think I want to do another one afterwards about how to actually get all the stakeholders on the same page after you've done this work. But this is the first project for you to report back the picture of the market and then no one's going to agree with you. So then you have to go and like convince everybody. And I have a whole thing called the game of marketing risk. Uh, okay, so you've done this stuff, you got the words out of the customer's mind and you've done some of this enrichment and you've done some crunching. So what do you do from there to actually go and find partners? And here are some really useful shorthand tricks. You know, there are like, there are more complicated research methods. I honestly don't care because this would be good enough to find probably like a hundred partners, you know, in a, in a week. Uh, you'll be like overwhelmed with this. And these are the most important partners. And these are all like search tricks. Uh, and it sounds ridiculous that it's this easy, but it really is. So number one, Google suggests, it's amazing. Put your company name or some major competitor and put versus, right? First thing I do is find all the competitors because that gives you a map of your neighbor, like your the actual category you're in, and then we'll, we'll show you what to do next from here. So for instance, I'm just gonna pick on MailChimp because uh, I didn't wanna show you my AppBind research here. So MailChimp, you know, so then we find their competitors, Constant Contact, Active Campaign, HubSpot, Clavio, ConvertKit. Okay, great. So you start enumerating all the other email service providers. Then uh, you put in your competitors as well and just do that again around the top like five or 10 just to see what else you missed because sometimes there are things that don't come up, Google suggest. So that gives you a pretty good set of, of the major competitors that are people are actually searching about. Um, then you can chain them together. So I just put the major ones like MailChimp, Constant Contact, Active Campaign, Clavio, and what you'll get are these, uh, these articles first that tell you the product category in the reviewer's minds, how they would describe it. So there's, a different, there's a different terms, right? E-commerce marketing platform, email marketing software, ESP, email service provider. These are different jargon that your customers are using. This, is, like, this strategy, uh, I'm using it for competitors it, of chaining together related terms in a list and then searching for people talking about the list is a critical search strategy. This is absolutely the one thing that I'm surprised people don't do more often. For the men that journal, I have of key terms, put a bunch of terms together. You can do the same thing and find people talking about similar ideas. It's ex is, surprisingly effective and it, very few people do it. So that's a good tip here, right here, if you don't do it right now. Um, you can also then search for review sites specifically using top best reviews. You start seeing what people are saying, uh, extremely useful. Also you get to see the review sites and who was talking about these things because those are people you might want to build relationships with. And by the way, record every, everything, you know, every like blog or whatever, put in that, in that uh, spreadsheet. Uh, as well, because you want to end up building a media relationship with them too. Uh, of course, uh, the review sites themselves are incredibly useful data, right? Because they'll show you um, not only your competitors, but you can read the reviews as well and start understanding in the words of their customers, positive, negative thoughts about them, the words that they would use to describe what their expectations were, how the stories they would tell. Well, you know, active campaign, you know, is the greatest because it allowed me to run my business or whatever, you know, my floors business from Bali or whatever people are talking about, you know, is what they expected the product to deliver. You start to understand the stories that your, your position will have to meet. And I don't know very many people who read the reviews, um, most SaaS companies of their competitors, but they're actually the most useful kind of data you can, you can find. Um, 
And then, you know, I use SEM Rush uh, as well. There's a lot of stuff in SEM Rush. Uh, there's other tools like AREFs and you know Neil Patel stuff, but I'm an SEM Rush person. But basically, the, uh, your SEO tools will tell you what people are talking about. And if you have an SEO team internally, you can just turn to them and ask them for help. But you know you can find all the competitors using the domain competitor analysis. Um, I'll show you a bunch of other things in a second um, with SEM Rush. But once you start building this list of competitors, then you get into something called snowballing, where you take your existing set of data you've done, and now you go deeper to understand what's going. So you just put it back into the machine and turn it again. So you know you can you can. Uh, for instance, start looking specifically for the integrations of your competitors on Google now that you enumerated them. This will give you a very good list of the set of partners that are very common in your product category, right? Very simple thing. Like this is the whole integration directory for active campaign would come up for someone maybe new trying to build a MailChimp looking for partners. Uh, Zapier is actually an enormously useful tool because they their Zapier recommends engine. It has a very naive ranking order the most popular like the one that's the most into the, the zap the, the most common one is number one and number two is number two and number three is number three there's no cleverness behind it uh so you just take this whole list and that is exact rank order of demand from your customers it is like absolutely amazing data and in fact this alone will help you prioritize where to focus uh these integrations uh, and because your partners, your competitors are unlikely to have integrated with everything, Zapier allows you to integrate with things that are missing. Uh, if you do it for all your competitors, you'll get a pretty good map of, of what is the priority amongst your customers. Um, again, back to SEM Rush, you can put the products into SEM Rush and for your competitors and do the backlink analysis. Here, you know, this was, I think, active campaign, I believe. Uh, and it shows you all the people who, who uh, link to them. And you notice a lot of them are actually, you know, software companies, right? <laughs> so it's like, that's a pretty good indication who the most powerful partners are, right? Of your competitors, right? So again, good priority ranking. Uh, the keyword gap is also useful. So um, here this shows you the things where they're people are talking about your competitors and not about you. It's not that they, you don't wanna know what they're talking about um, but they get, like, you want to know everything they're talking about, but the gap also shows you a bit about what's missing in your story that you might need to improve. There's a bunch of other like keyword analysis tools to understand what's going on in your competitors. But you want to understand what the story is being told, right, for, for the positioning. And like, this is like just it's an amazing amount of data in this thing. I just love it. Um, you could also use Google News to see what's up uh, in their story, especially bigger competitors. So, you know, see the see story two here, active campaign extends ecosystem with tech giants, pretty good indication, you know, where you need to focus, right? Marketing apps added to the active campaign marketplace. Like this is just all partnerships, you know, it's just like catnip for us. Uh, also, you should look at SpyFu to look at inbound links, similar to backlinks, just another data set, similar but different. Uh, gives you good, you know, indication of uh, again who's talking about your competitors, and they might be potential influencers. Uh, you can also look for service partners. Usually, it's a partner directory or service partners or consultants or agencies. Just kind of use those kind of set of terms when you're looking for the service partners for like active campaign, whatever. Here, it's consultants. Here, I found. See, if I was journaling, I write down, you know. Uh, automation consultants, active campaign, right? That's what the term they're using, certified marketing automation consultants. So then I would search for that specific phrase and active campaign together to see what people are saying, uh, who self-identify with that label. Because then you can go uh, to LinkedIn, right? And look specifically for people who describe themselves as that on LinkedIn. So Infusionsoft, I mean, they're not called Infusionsoft anymore, but they used to be called Infusionsoft certified consultants. And this actually might be a good way to pick up consultants because these are people who haven't updated their name to keep certified consultants. Uh, so they may be you know, vulnerable uh, for Infusionsoft and available for you. So like, this is extremely useful to find service partners, right? And then you should start calling them, try to interview them and introduce them to tell you what's going on tell about their experience with their partner, you know, do all that kind of qualitative research. It just helps you find them pretty quickly and like what's going on. And they'll you know, ask them where they find more people like them, all the same stuff, snowballing, do the same thing over and over and over again. It, it just keep putting it back into the machine, right? It's just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat uh, using this list. And you know, you, you, if you have the journal and you have that spreadsheet, right, over time, and it's just building, 
you know, you just keep doing it over and over again. And eventually, you know, uh, you'd be amazed what the opportunities you'll, you'll uncover if you're doing a systematic approach. So, I mean, that's basically, you know, that's the basic framework for doing this. Um, there's obviously a lot more you can do. So I'm gonna stop talking here because that's a lot of tactics uh, and let people just ask questions at this point. That was made. That was that was a lot, Sanir. Um, I'm Thanks I'm so specifically kind of interested more about the LinkedIn piece of it. I, I love that kind of workflow, of kind of identifying, that kind of using it essentially as as a kind of a qualifying tool. Um, is there any use case that you kind of like recently have done with with that? Yeah. So, um, for instance, I'm targeting Facebook ad agencies and HubSpot agencies for app buying. So I'm looking for you know HubSpot certified consultant, inbound marketing agency. I, look, I've, I've found some terms that they use. Uh, there's also communities and LinkedIn groups that I've joined. I'm trying to now rip through those. Uh, there are certain ways of, of, of using and abusing Slack communities uh, for your advantage as well, which I will not tell you since I run a Slack community. Uh, <laughs> doing it. Um, but there are tools out there. Uh, I like Phantom Buster. That's my favorite one. So then you can go out and, and start building lists you have to be careful um, to, you can end up uh, getting us like a, so much data with your list and not knowing where to start, but just mentally acquiring stuff for a while, you, you just diverge for all, just acquire, right? And then you just stop, like you don't know what to do with this massive stuff. And then you just, you know, organize it a little bit. And then you, you'll, you'll, you can probably feel where you can focus and then you just run campaigns. You, can't, you don't have to eat the whole market at once, but when you're researching, it's better to enjoy the snowball. Just keep, just explore it wherever it goes. And, and the more you do it, the more it becomes easier for you to tactically do. Like you just learn, like you put the words together in Google and search for everything at once. You learn to go on LinkedIn, look for the, um, the certified consultant thing, right? And then the more you do it, uh, you, you just find a new term, you, you put it in there and you dump the list and put it into the spreadsheet and keep going. Uh, and then you build your journal. You just do that for like a few days. And then you stop and consolidate. Awesome. Anybody got any questions? I mean, geez, that was a lot there. Um, it's like, it's like I mean, three years. Like, you're like Mr. Automation. Um, so it's it's really, you know, is there a process that anybody has gone through now that, you know, works for them? Um, I probably guarantee you can find an automation around it. Um, so there's a good opportunity to ask them. Well, one thing you could do, I didn't mention, uh, is I've uh, you could use some of these directories as well, like SASMAX and LEO Plus, if they are al aligned to your category. I didn't mention them specifically uh, here because they come up in the directory searches, uh, and then you would just go buy them. But if you are actually in uh, a particular channel, like the IT channel, uh, I would definitely go SASMAX and use your partner optimizer and LEO Plus. Uh, you're like a European-centric thing, and that would be another group to go after they they basically take over a lot of this work for you from automation and then api deck uh gj's uh, thing he's actually like pulling together the list of integrations that people are doing as well so you can just get the data from him as well if you want to i think buy it from him hey, hey sunir uh carlos here how are you good uh quick question so can you sh search also by industry focus based on their business? I mean, if you're looking for service providers that are focused, say, manufacturing industry. Um, yeah, in so in in, in in part, in SAS Max and LEO Plus, that's the kind of stuff they would do is you can do it industry focused because uh, they've already built databases that you can, you're basically paying them for to get access. So that's what I would do. And then in, uh, otherwise you're going to have to go through and like do it for yourself and qualify it uh, right. based on their homepage. Yep. In Built With, there's actually a uh, tool. Uh, called, it's a new tool for me. It's called LeadEye. Uh, and what you can do is you can give it a bunch of domains. I, I actually built a tool to do this myself, uh, but they built a better one. And so I would do this. So you can put a bunch of domains in and what you, you, you just go like next and like yes or no. And you just like skip through a bunch of domains, qualified or junk, like qualified or junk next. And just goes right. back, like through a whole bunch of domains. Uh, you can go through it. And you, you know, I hire VAs often to say like this is qualified or not um, for me. So, so if you're looking for, if you have a bunch of, let's say, 
I don't know, uh, HubSpot partners, right? And you're focusing on those who handle healthcare, right? So right. you're looking for HIPAA compliance. So one thing you can do is, you know, look for specifically for the intersection of those who have the keyword HIPAA and that, like on that list, or you can go through and have someone rip through the uh, thing using lead eye and built with, it's pretty simple. Or you can just go and scrape all the homepages looking for the word HIPAA. Uh, again, like I would have written, I have code to do this on my laptop. Um, revealing how much of a robot I really am, truly, underneath <laughs> it all. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are certainly services that allow you, you can do this. And you can go to Upwork and also people, you can ask, put projects up for this. And look, here's a list. I want to know how many are, have this term. People, like, it's like, you know, it's not worth your time to do it by hand. People can do it for three figures. Did you say it was Lead IQ or what was the name of the tool? Lead it was I. the one I like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it lead I, E, Y, E, or lead I, the letter? I haven't used lead IQ in a long time, so I can't speak to that one. Uh, I use built with. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's lead, lead IQ. IQ. I've used, but I don't use them. And then like Zoom Info is also pretty good at this. I, I haven't used them in a long time either. Yeah. I use Bombora for intent data. I use the free one. <laughs> the free version of that. Have you heard of, heard of them? Yes, I haven't used it, so I can't speak to it. Okay, it's useful. Yeah. So you're, have you used uh, LEO Plus for the partner qualifying before? You said it was Europe specific? Yeah, oh. so I, I, I will admit that I did, have not had a great success with them because they a lot of the partners in the database are not aware they're in the LEO Plus database. And so when you contact them, uh, they're confused. Also, our product is not actually fitting the LEO Plus marketplace model because we are a tool to support service partners to manage partnerships. Like we are the vendor management tool that you have a partner management tool, they have a, we have a vendor management tool for them. So it's not quite the same as them looking for reselling opportunities, like products they can resell. So we didn't all really align with what they were doing. You might have a better success with your products in there because it's actually kind of what they're after. Right, um, the 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 database in there, but a lot of their database is actually on. They don't even know they're in the LU Plus database because they come in through um, list acquisition. So you have to be you have to be careful on the, on the outreach messaging there. Yeah, it's hey, like, Sanir. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Sanir, it's Joe. Sorry, I'd ha I'd normally have my uh, video on, but I'm in the car. But I really appreciate this so far. It's been super interesting. I, I wanted to get your take, you know, this, this has seemed very kind of automated, kind of one to many, but with strategic kind of contextual search through a bunch of cool tools and automation that you use. Curious what your take is on more strategic partnership sourcing. And I'll give you a use case, right? So right now at Cision, we've got kind of a big project where we may have maybe five companies that are on a hit list that we hypothesize are potentially a really good fit for this. And one of the challenges I've had is, you know, typically what I'll do is I'll go to LinkedIn, I'll source, you know, anyone with kind of a biz dev partnership, corp dev, whatever type title, and, uh, you know, do some cold outreach that way. But the challenge is when, you're, when your hit list is so small, you know, when you get a no, it hurts that much more, right? Or we're not interested, it hurts that because you, you only have such a small yeah. tool to work with. So you, you haven't done the work. Like that's the problem. So here, here's, here's, I mean, that's the harsh truth. So, yeah. um, so while I'm revealing all my secrets, you may be surprised how much of the CSA is a robotic database tracking every movement that you guys do. Actually, not, <laughs> not as much as you think, but more than will happen over time. But like, no, here's part of the thing. So I, you know, uh, I often joke that CSA is a square dance for, for professionals who should actually pick up the phone and talk to each other, who otherwise won't without us playing the square dance music for you. It's a series of games. Uh, these companies you want to reach out to, their job is to look for opportunities, uh, but you, what you, you haven't landed the, the story. And this is why the positioning thing really matters. Uh, you, like, a lot of companies are really focused on themselves and your needs, but like I said, your partners don't care about you. They can't, they're focused on them to their customers. And what you haven't done is the homework to align your mm. story and your position into their story and position to show that their story and position will be stronger because of you. You haven't, you haven't set the big vision. And what, you know, I have this other whole spiel called the romance of partnerships because I think 
literally everything is dating. You have to set a big vision about what is going on with this relationship from the beginning. And that is gonna be driven from the customers, right? Or some other common like external market demand that they can't meet without you. And so when you're, it's, so yeah, you might have Salesforce as a target, right? But what you haven't done is gone and found out all the problems that Salesforce is having in the market by looking, doing this research the same research strategy, I start with competitors because it's the easiest one. It goes the same. You just keep going and going and going with every single kind of bit of information. So with Salesforce, it could be the implementation partners who are all complaining about something. It could be their customers complaining about something, reviews and ratings. You just keep going, doing this loop over and over again until you understand the story of what people are saying about your partner, right? And then you figure out how you're going to fix one of those problems. Right? And if you have your own customers who are, you know, are good examples of that, then even stronger, you're building your argument, mm. right? Uh, but if you go straight to like VP or whatever, I need you to sell my stuff. They're like, I don't care about you. Like, I just don't. I mean, you may, I may like, I might have dinner with you as a person, but I don't care about the business, <laughs> right? Because all people are nice, but they just don't, they can't. Not, like, you, you get, like if it's dating, they're like, they're like single parents and you're trying to get to their children, right? Which are the customers. Like, they're not going to trust you to bring you to the customers, right? You need to do the work to show that you actually do a good job for whomever they are serving. And that's the problem. That's why you need to do this work, right? To understand the pain, the storytelling, you gotta tell that story. It's a clear vision about how you fit to their story. It's not about you. It's about them and their customer, them and their partners, whatever you're serving. Does that make sense? Totally, dude. I, I appreciate it. And I think it's valuable. I think, you know, uh, thinking about my outreach, it is, you know, it's very much about, you know, we have this problem that we think you could solve, but it's still very we, we, we versus them, 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 which I think is what I'm hearing from you, right? It needs to be more about them. Um, so no, super helpful. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, partnership teams come in from my own experience uh, consulting and I'm a prima donna. I would, I don't work for these companies if I can help it, but I talked to a lot of CEOs, like they inbounded a lot of cool opportunities at some conference from some other, you know, and then they, they're ad hocking them and then they bring a partnership person, but then uh, to manage it, cause they don't want to do with it. But the ego hit of having some big company talk to you at a conference, you know, you know, CEO to CEO or whatever uh, is not, is not actually partnerships. You're not, cause the point of a partnership is to go to market together to serve a common customer. All right. And, and as a professional partnership person, you need to bring order to that and like focus it entirely on the customer, you know, how they're being served, you know, how are they winning? How is the customer getting value from the two partners working together? And then you capture value in return together, uh, hopefully mutually. And that is, a, that is a, you have to be careful about the, like the ego type of partnerships where you just want to post big logos, the trophy case, um, you know, all those app directories are trophy cases. You know, you don't want that. You know, you have to be focused on the customer and their use cases, which is basics, but it doesn't happen with as much as we want. Smart. Love it. Thank you. Who else? Who's having a, like, I don't know who my partners are a problem right now. Who wants to talk about it? I am. All right, Amir. Lay it on me. Uh, so... Where I'm challenged with everything is I swim in a, a very small pond, right? Uh, we're Apple only product. Our deal sizes are very small. Uh, and your company has to, everybody in your company has to be using Apple in order to use our product. So I've gone through the Apple consulting network, which obviously makes the first sense because they have access to all the customers that are using Apple. I'm trying to find a way to get beyond that. How do I figure out which agencies are using Apple and what, I, I haven't been able to figure out what my value prop is for anybody else outside of the Apple consulting network. Yeah, so again, um, in your case, I mean, let's face it, Amir, I mean, Daylight and FreshBooks are pretty uh, you know, similar markets. So I have, a, I have a fair idea what's going on in your world. It, it's, it's, it's easy to start with your limitations uh, which is I'm Apple or oriented and then focus on the partners that are immediately close to your limitations. First, again, the market does not care about your limitations. That's your problem to resolve. You know that we talked about that, but yeah. given that it's still, it's a constraint that you, you, it's a constraint, but it's not a limitation uh, either. And it could be, a, it could also be a strength if you do it right. Uh, it's not, it's not the consultants that are your, your, your target customer. You have to know who your target customer is. So it's probably going to be, you know, like creative agencies, 
maybe photographers, people who are like really Mac oriented videographers. There is definitely a segment of creative professionals who are Mac oriented. You start with the customer there. They may not care in the slightest that you are an Apple only product because they just take it as for granted that you're Apple. So then you just got to find out what is motivating them to buy one piece of software or another. And the fact, and then the fact that you're Apple oriented you know, is not a not an objection to them because they don't even care. And it could be a plus because you have a native experience, you know, it's like, yeah, and it's also a beautiful, you know, Apple friendly experience, especially for designerly people, they really like that. So, so you, you're, you're just, you're focused on the next step out of your company towards the market, but you have to start with the customer. That's why I said customer first, map your way back to you, right? You, they're the ones with all the money, the customer. You gotta find a path from the customer to you not from you to the customer. And I know we're all oriented to for us to find a path to their customer, but you gotta work backwards, right? Because that's how like, they're the ones searching around for answers and your job is to meet them where the market is. Uh, and that's, that's why this is useful, right? It gets you out of your, your four walls of your office and starts thinking about the wider market beyond you. And only the partnership team, in my experience, does this work. So it's a good skill to have. Okay, thank you. How about you, Shana? You're new. You joined for this reason. Yes, I am um, brand new. Um, <clears throat> so we also have a, a quite a small market at this point. We sell only into higher education. Um, up to this point, it has been very reactive. Um, we previously called it business development as, you know, these inbound opportunities came around. We would have somebody put, sometimes in marketing, sometimes in sales, just say, yep, let's make it work. Let's, let's you know, get as much exposure out there as we can. And um, we have experienced some exponential growth in the last two years. And the need has um, has come to put somebody full-time into this, this seat. Um, I <clears throat> was the best potential candidate because I have kind of made my rounds in the organization. I know all the products really well. I've, I've um, had some cross departmental functions. So what I'm doing right now is kind of trying to rebuild the program from scratch. And uh, the, the, the uh, front half of that, your presentation, um, Sunir, is exactly what I needed to see, right? Where do we even start with something like this? Where, what is the playbook for us to, to know exactly based on you know who our ideal customers are, what is going to fill those gaps and give our customers the best experience possible? I'll give you a story uh, about in higher ed. I tried to do education tech software in a long, long ago. And if you look at my consultancy, Bibdex, it's because I've tried to sell bibliography software and then they decided that education, no one had money for this stuff. Uh, it's a very and, unique beast, this industry, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but I, there's this company in Toronto called Top Hat, uh, who is extremely good at what they do. And they found an amazing sales motion into higher ed. And what they did is, yeah, they bang their head against the administrative sale. Like administrators buy everything in higher ed, right? But they're impossible to sell to. And they buy stuff no one wants. But they found that they, the, the problem was in the, the classroom. So they, they just kept working. What is the actual problem that you're having? Who's talking about this? Who's experienced the pain? And, and it's, it wasn't even like the professors exactly that they cared. Like a lot of professors just don't care, but they have a requirement to report to get their tenure or whatever the motivation was. And they provided the, like the real-time clicking like evaluation module. And so what they did is they, they just went straight to the professor. Hey, we will give you this thing for free. Uh, customer, your students will buy it. These dropped right in and just went to the professors and gave away like, I think iPads for free or something to get them to buy it, right? Got the students to, and then they went to the administration. It's like, we have like six of your classrooms, buy it, you know, so you can manage it. Uh, but they, that's, that was, that's the power of the ethnographic, ethnomethodological sales. You're, you're looking for the actual, what is the actual problem and who actually has it? And how can I interrupt that process to start with? Right, and then you then you leverage that to get the other sale because like when you go to the administration, they don't care or feel anything what your your actual pain is, and their job is to deflect you, and so that's what you're experiencing. But if you create just like for John, you have to create the demand from what they what they are accountable towards, right? Which is their students and professors. You, know, you create there's a pain there that I think you're managing, right? That's the pain, the student pain, right? Ultimately. Uh right? Ultimately, yes, we um, we serve we create um, communication tools to serve better outcomes for students. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to find where that pain, you know, if impacts 
administration in whatever way and then work your way up there. And that required, you know, top out to make strategic choices, but the partnership leader, if you want to be like a really high impact, like at the C level and get in that universe is that you're, you are the one who knows all these stories because you're spending your time talking to everybody in the market and figuring out how to align the company to it. That's really what the partnership function does uh, in my view. So that's, that's, that's basically, you know, a, a success story, Top Hat, who in your space, who did something like that. And you have the opportunity, you know, and you can work your way in with one kind of partnership after another, right? To work your way through there to prove that case and make mm -hmm. successes. But that, that's perhaps how I would approach your space. But I also burnt myself in edutech. So I kind of like afraid of the administrative style <laughs> as well. It's a, it's also a very small world. Yeah, it's a, it's a small, it's small uh, web. Oh, Jens call me Sunil. I oh, those signpost people, sign easy people. Sorry, always call me Sunil after Sunil Patro. I'm gonna get Jens for that one. Um, uh, we're, we're at time. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of mindful of everybody's time here. So um, if there's any other questions, we're gonna yeah, Sunir is in the Slack group as you guys yeah. all know. So we'll take it over there, and there's a few links to share as well. So thanks for um, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Bye.